uh, Sergio Seminar. And uh, let me introduce our uh, today's speaker. Uh, it's uh, Dr. Thomas Helbling. Uh, he's the uh, Chief of uh, World uh, Economic Studies Division at the IMF uh, Research Department. And um, Dr. Helbling uh, has done research in such areas as the international uh, business cycle linkages, international aspects of inflation. Uh, another remarkable uh, area of uh, his specialization is commodity price uh, formation and also economic history. And uh, to the title of uh, today's talk uh, will be Hopes, uh, Realities and Risk. Uh, the global economic outlook, and it is uh, based on uh, the most recent uh, April 2013 uh, issue of uh, of uh, the World uh, Economic Outlook. Uh, this is a very important uh, semi-annual uh, publication by uh, by IMF uh, economists, and uh, uh, every time. Uh, it is uh, uh, very much related, and uh, this is this publication is a, a must read for uh, every uh, microeconomist working in the private sector or uh, in, uh, in public institutions. And um, uh, one uh, friend uh, of, of mine, uh, and uh, among other things, uh, this publication uh, updates uh, uh, projections uh, uh, forecasts. That uh, IMF economists uh, uh, compute for uh, key uh, macroeconomic uh, indicators for uh, various countries. Uh, and one friend of mine uh, who, is, um, uh, who works for, uh, for the World Bank uh, uh, told me uh, the other day that uh, the IMF's uh, forecast uh, was considered as a uh, sort of uh, uh, very important uh, reference point. And, uh, uh, honestly, uh, the World Bank uh, uses it at, uh, as uh, a very important uh, uh, key, in, as a key ingredient in uh, their own forecast. So, uh, and uh, let me uh, let me uh, give this floor to uh, Dr. Helbings, and uh, please. So, just. Uh, thank you, Professor Fischer, for the kind of introduction. Uh, so, my talk today is about uh, our most recent World Economic Outlook. And it has the title, um, Hopes, Realities and Risks. And I just wanted to say, we, our for, uh, the World Economic Outlook focuses around, uh, focuses around the forecasts. Uh, but uh, you know the joke that uh, God created economists just to make weather forecasts look better. And uh, so the forecast is an important uh, aspect, it guides us, but I think the, much of the world economic outlook is also about the big themes. And uh, we are about to start a new round, we do update quarterly, so let me also hint a bit where we think we will be going uh, in the next few months. Our, we also have quarterly updates in January and July, and the July update uh, we can start working basically when I'm going back to, to Washington. So <clears throat> here just a quick roadmap. Uh, we have, I would like to talk a bit about the state of the global economy. And so our headline in April was that the risks are down, but the forecasts are not up which in many ways is a puzzle, and I would like to elaborate on that. And then a, the big theme really in this uh, World Economic Outlook has been the, the three-speed recovery. So if Europe stuck in low gear, the United States improving, surprisingly robust, and then still strong, resilient growth in emerging market and developing economies. And then, time permitting, uh, I have a few slides also about the most recent analytical chapters. One uh, has a very prosaic uh, title, The Dog That Didn't Bark. It's about uh, understanding recent inflation developments in the advanced economies and prospects for inflation. So, if inflation is a dog, is inflation really muzzled? 
or has it just been sleeping and should we expect inflation to pick up? And then we also have uh, a chapter on low income economies uh, breaking through the frontier. So, coming to starting with the title, the hope, of course, is that uh, we will leave the global financial crisis behind us. And in many ways, what we've seen over the past few years at a global level matches the experience that we have with financial crisis in individual countries. And the experience always is that after a crisis or when a crisis starts, there's a big drop in output. The, the activity, so to speak, collapses. And then there is an adjustment phase. And then there are many different outcomes. But typically, you have relative to pre-crisis trend, you have a permanent output loss. And, but ideally, uh, economies go back on their previous growth path. So the slope is the same, but just below. And so if we just look here relative uh, to the pre-crisis peak, you have a sharp drop in output and then the adjustment phase and in the end the pickup. And so the hope is that we're really starting to be in a pickup phase. And uh, indeed, here uh, you see in, uh, for all advanced economies that experienced the financial uh, banking crisis after 2008, uh, activity has, has started to pick up and the, the hope now for almost two years has been that sort of this will be sort of the definitive recovery. Now the reality is of course that problems are continuing, that uh, the growing out of the crisis has occurred at very different speeds across uh, economies. And so what we've seen over the past years, I think, in, uh, in the U.S., we always talk about uh, the fiscal cliff. That sort of by the end of 2012, if uh, there was no policy action, there would be sort of this almost catastrophic, like fiscal adjustment, where fiscal tightening, sort of a fiscal drag of 4% of GDP, would just pull, pull the U.S. economy back into recession. That was avoided at the, at the end uh, of 2012. And in, in the euro area, there was really uh, what the policymakers did. They put in, uh, into place a policy framework that uh, addressed the most acute uh, crisis risk. They had the OMT, uh, the Outright Monetary Transactions, uh, sort of uh, a program that would uh, counter any run in, a, in the sovereign bond markets. At the same time, they put into place the European Stability Mechanism, a fund to address acute uh, financing needs. Uh, the program for Greece was continued. Uh, there were um, other changes, in, but in particular it was Greece, where there were big concerns that the program would sort of end and Greece would just uh, go down further. And in response to all these various actions ever since uh, global financial markets have rallied, on the left-hand side um, uh, you see equity prices. And the rally has been particularly strong in emerging markets and in the United States. But then more noticeably, what you have seen... Oh, sorry. I'm sort of, I was wrong button. I tried this one. So what you also have seen is that in Italy and Spain, bond bond yields on sovereign bonds have come down. And in fact, this chart is a bit dated. It goes back to early April. If you, if you look now, sort of bond yields will be back down here. So roughly sort of 2010 levels, more or less before the crisis started. And this is the good news. So if, uh, I think really the, you have mark, sovereign bond markets have realized, have normalized with this uh, Public finances, finan uh, public financial positions have become more sustainable. Right? And then the expectation is if you have financial markets, if you have a rally, financial markets tend to be forward looking. Uh, the expectation was then that the economic recovery would not be far away because financial conditions would be easy. And, now, and that's where. Uh, Start. And I think that's right now the crux of what's uh, going on in Europe uh, and is that credit markets 
And uh, you should uh, you know, of course, that in Europe, banking, the banking sector, is the dominant source of finance. So credit continues to contract. And this chart is uh, it ends in 2012 at the moment. But if you have more recent data, that credit contraction is ongoing. And unlike, you also see, unlike in the United States, where surveys among loan officers indicate that loan conditions have eased over the past few quarters, uh, loan or credit conditions continue to tighten. And so each uh, period uh, indicates a tightening relative to the, to the last quarter. So you yeah, really have a cumulative tightening in financial conditions in the euro area. And the issue then is for, for the euro area that in the so-called what we call the euro area periphery, starting from Greece, uh, going along the southern uh, ring of the euro area up to Ireland, is that the monetary easing has come through a little bit, in the sense lending rates here have come down a bit, but lending rates are still very high. There's a big difference here relative to Germany, and the lending rates have come down only relatively little uh, relative to pre-crisis peaks. And so the issue really is that you have, especially in an economy like Spain, where you, had a where you have a banking crisis, where you have a real estate uh, bubble that burst, you have a private sector that still suffers from a debt overhang, and you have continue to have very tight uh, credit and financial conditions. And this really is a toxic mix. Um, and here, sorry, and this is really interesting, right? Uh, what do you expect after a financial crisis, after uh, households or firms are over indebted, is a reduction of the debt burden. What you see here in the United States is since the peak in, in 2008, household debt really has come down. It has come down to level, levels seen in early 2000s. If you then contrast the developments in Spain, um, Portugal, or the euro area as a whole, and the euro area that includes whole, all the countries, but if you focus on the so-called crisis countries, there has been very little adjustment in the debt burden so far. And clearly, high interest, the high interest burden, the high debt service burden, is one of the issues there. So going forward, and I'll come to numbers uh, uh, just in a minute, uh, Difficult financial market conditions in Europe are expected to continue in the sense what we have had is the, the ECB policy measures before that the long-term uh, repurchase operations have eased some of the most acute uh, crisis risk. But in many European, in the European banking sector, in the periphery, bank funding costs stay very high. Banks still have to reduce uh, their leverage their assets relative to equity and this can go uh, in two ways either, either raising capital which is very difficult and uh, European banks in the periphery face still relatively high financing costs much higher than in the euro area core so often uh, deleveraging or reducing the leverage is achieved to, by selling assets so financial conditions are expected to be continue to be a drag at the same time, you have uh, the balance sheet asset quality is deteriorating further with the economy being uh, the euro area economy contracting. So you have this vicious circle. And we think that this, uh, this equation will only ease very gradually. So the euro area will sort of very gradually uh, move out of the crisis. So in the sense, contraction will continue. And actually, output starting to grow only in the last quarter of this year and then more definitively in 2014. So that's almost uh, two and a half years of recession in the euro area again, after recession already in, in 2008. So the, in this sense, that is the, when you go back to the paradigm or the metaphor of the three-speed global economy, that is sort of the economy stuck in low gear for some time. And its improvements will be very slow. Then we come to the, to the second speed. These are the advanced economies, in particular the United States, where the private sector has, is about to recover from the crisis. And if you, in the US, where the corporate sector, in terms of financial 
uh, burden in terms of financial uh, conditions had, was much less of a problem. In the U.S. it was really, on the one hand, the banking sector, or the financial sector, the large, and then the household sector. And what you see here in how is what I showed before that, that the debt burden has come down. And at the same time, saving has increased a bit, and then the red line, that's net lending by households. That's savings minus in investment by households. So ever since uh, 2008, financial, uh, the household sector has saved more than it has invested, and is now back sort of in, in the black or in the positive area. And the higher saving, of course, that was needed to reduce and repay debt. So, and what we now in our forecast, if you look at our forecast, is we expect private sector demand in the second half of 2013 to grow roughly at 3% consumption and investment. This is slightly higher than, uh, than potential, which is closer than 2.5%. And so the private sector has really recovered and is now with some pent-up demand in the housing sector, but also for other consumer durables and to some extent investment, you will now have, uh, we are expecting sort of this really push or this boost to the economy. Now, but our forecast for overall output in the United States this year is uh, only 2%, and the main culprit, so to speak, is the public sector. And here, if you look at the bar, that's the fiscal impulse. And in fact, uh, the chart is a bit unfortunate because the fiscal there is a fiscal impulse if the bar were negative. So what you see is here for Japan with the fiscal stimulus. Here you have some fiscal uh, you have some fiscal impulse, whereas here you actually have a fiscal drag. And what you can see is relative to October the fiscal drag has increased. And now for our next forecast we expect even a bit more of a fiscal drag. So uh, relatively booming private sector. Uh, the impact on, on aggregate growth will be offset by uh, fiscal drag to contraction in government demand in particular and the somewhat higher tax intake. This is also the situation in terms of uh, the, the private sector having recovered in some of the other economies affected by financial issues, mostly of them linked uh, to the U.S. After, through tight financial, cross-border financial linkages including Switzerland and Sweden. So uh, Japan is somewhere in between in the sense the private sector still demand is relatively muted, but we expect in 2013 and 14 uh, a boost to growth from quite a sizable fiscal stimulus and supported also down by more aggressive monetary easing. So then, this then uh, our most recent forecast, and uh, the most noticeable, uh, as noted earlier, is if you look here at our forecast for global growth, it's about three and a quarter percent, roughly the same as in 2012. In fact, and if you look at number of economies, uh, 2013 is even slightly worse than it was uh, 2012. Now. Um, I think if you want to have a look at the numbers, you will have uh, access to the, uh, to the presentation. So I'm not uh, going to go to the numbers. One thing, though, which is also different, which is changing, and that will be the next uh, topic if we then go to emerging market and developing economies, there is now um, a sense that something close to 8%, I'm increasing it probably on the lower side of 8%, that this is the new normal in China which has big implications for the global economy. I'll show you a chart in a minute. And it also has big implications uh, in particular for commodity markets. And I think uh, prospects have become less buoyant. Ask yeah. a question about Russia. I mean, lately, I think the, the Ministry of, of the Economy of Russia has decreased their official projections for the economy. And here, as far as I understand, you have increased even this projection for to 3.7 or no? So this is uh, this is the, ah, the line is the January. So I see the it's, it's was lowered, but uh, today actually somebody also told me about the new forecast uh, closer to two and a half. Or yeah, 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 and then less. So, so okay. Uh, now it's 
just uh, aside how we do the, the world economic forecast uh, or the global economic forecast and the world economic outlook. So what we do in the research department, we coordinate the forecasting exercise and we um, give what we call top-down guidance. So we prepare the assumptions and then we have a small uh, global macroeconometric model where we feed in the incoming data, where we feed in the new assumptions, and then where we look at what the change in the assumptions and the incoming data would imply for the forecast. Now the issue with the model a bit is that the model is better in the one to two year horizon when the, the main sort of macroeconomic uh, relationships play out. In the short term, so for the one first uh, one to two quarters, usually the model itself isn't that good because there's a lot of noise and uh, in, 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 in the latest incoming data and to sort of filter out the signal is, is not easy. And so we often find that in the current year. So we then, with that top guidance, that's what we give to our uh, country teams. Sometimes it depends a bit on the country team. So obviously, uh, in the case of Russia, they seem to be a bit behind the curve. And uh, that's probably one of the messages I'll take back home. So this, again, uh, this is just uh, visualizing uh, the forecast. And, sorry. Uh, so without uh, going into detail, I, I think what is very clear is that the the, uh, the near-term forecast is quite dire for the euro area, the blue line at the bottom. Then the, U the U.S. economy expected to improve, has been quite resilient, and even with a stronger than uh, expected fiscal drag this year, and perhaps even next year, the economy seems surprisingly resilient. What you also see is uh, then here, in the case of Japan, how bumpy the projection is. So the the fiscal stimulus uh, leads lead to a very uh, strange short-term uh, growth dynamics in the sense first you have the stimulus, then next year the stimulus is starting to be unwound and you're going to, starting to gonna have a drag, then we expect some recovery and then the tax hike, uh, the VAT increases that are planned uh, in two steps will come to, into place in 2014. So Japan is somewhere in between the Euro area and the United States. Here then on this side, we have the emerging market economies, where again, emerging Asia, which is really dominated by China, um, is quite stable, up high, and many uh, uh, countries wish to have growth rates in your, in the order of 7% uh, of, of emerging Asia as a whole. And then here you have Sub-Saharan Africa, and then here you have uh, Latin America, where growth has slowed noticeably, but is expected to improve. Now every forecast has risks, and so the tool we use in, in the outlook is a so-called fan chart, where we show the 90% probability in the wall around the baseline forecast. The, 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 traditionally, in most of econometrics, all the confidence, all the statistical information is built based on normal distribution. It's always symmetric around the, the baseline, which is essentially the expected mean. In our fan chart, this need not be. It can be asymmetric. And so what you can see, there is some upside risk, in the sense the area here. We still think downside risks in terms of the probability mass below the baseline forecast dominates and uh, this remains uh, a big concern. The main reason for concern uh, is um, at the moment is that we is that much of the recovery in the euro area is predicated of the assumption that there will be further uh, policy action. In particular, we think that the baseline can only be achieved if there will be banking sector reform, if they make progress on the banking union, if some of the weakest banks are either uh, resolved or being uh, supported with new capital, which in some cases will require public capital injection. Without that, it would seem uh, difficult. We also expect that in some economies there may be even some need 
for policy intervention to help the reducing the debt burden. Uh, that can be debt to equity swaps, other solutions, sort of acceleration of debt reduction, of debt forbearance, uh, and so on and so forth. So one of the key short-term risk is still, or the key concern in the short term is still in the euro area. And the main concern is that just that the policy action will not be forthcoming as expected. And then the issue is, is, uh, is sort of the interaction between what is still quite a fragile confidence in, in the private sector, in the banking sector, lack of uh, policy action, and the two together could then again sort of lead to a snowball effect where the euro area is uh, deteriorating again. As a benchmark, um, we have uh, in, in the past, sort of heuristically, you have to find the global recession if global growth falls uh, below 2%. That's roughly, when I mean, capital income terms, uh, per capita income uh, stagnates. In 2008, 2009, actually for the first time in the post-World War II history, global growth was actually negative. In all previous recessions, global growth was still positive, below 2%. But it remained positive. It was not the case in 2008. So here, if you look at, there is still the 90% probability involved. Still has uh, is partly below 2%. If you compare this to our October forecast, that area below 2% is smaller. So that's why we say the risks are down, but they're not down yet to the extent that we can sort of say with a reasonable degree of confidence that the global economy is out of the woods. Then, in the medium term, there are really two uh, risks, or three risks. One is just the euro area that uh, the whole recovery uh, from the financial crisis will take much longer, and that uh, the banking sector will take much uh, longer to come back to health, and so on and so forth, and that policy action may be forthcoming, but just at a slower pace than it should be. The other medium-term risks then are fiscal risks. We have Japan, which in many ways is highly indebted. Public sector, gross public debt is above 200%. It's an aging economy where age-related uh, expenditure is steadily increasing, where the government deficit is quite large. And just to stabilize the debt and eventually bring debt to more sustainable levels, uh, Japan needs large fiscal adjustment. And the issue with fiscal adjustment with uh, sustainable fiscal position, uh, positions is that these are medium-term concepts. So there's not the issue that Japan is sort of back to a fiscal surplus this year or next year. But the problem is the fiscal adjustment needed to stabilize and eventually reduce the debt is of a magnitude that considerable fiscal policy measures on the expenditure side but also on the revenue side are needed. And the experience is this is something that takes years takes a long time to address. Few people, a few countries have managed to do uh, the fiscal adjustment, which in the case of Japan is in excess, to just stabilize and reduce it, which in is in excess of 10% of GDP. I mean, this is not the kind of fiscal adjustment you achieve in one year. So and that's where this notion of credible medium-term plans, so where governments start to outline what are the steps uh, they will take to achieve the fiscal adjustment. Issues are similar, although I mean, the debt uh, burden, the debt, the debt overhang is not as dramatic in the United States as it is in Japan, but still in the United States in the second half of this, this decade, uh, the burden from age-related expenditure, which is not yet in the current, uh, including the fiscal deficit, which will only come on stream over the next few years, uh, is, uh, needs to be addressed. And there too is the notion that the U.S. government will need to put in place a credible medium-term fiscal plan. It's difficult. Uh, the political uh, fracturing in U.S. politics at the moment is always at the post-war high, which has made in particular decisions on fiscal policy very complicated. And we saw that in discussions around the fiscal cliff, we see it again in discussions on the so-called sequester, where there's very little agreement among the nature uh, and among the two political parties on how to address the fiscal problems. 
And finally, and that, uh, let me talk a bit about that uh, next term, is we are concerned about emerging market economies. The concerns about emerging market economies are like a different nature. And uh, what I will show over the next few slides is basically the combination of slowing potential growth and uh, sort of a legacy of possible financial excesses. And this could be, and uh, let me just uh, go into more details, this could also be potential, so potentially be sort of a toxic or non necessary to or problematic combination. And let me, uh, to elaborate a bit on that risk, is that the background to all this is that for emerging market economies, actually since 2008, uh, the recovery from the crisis has been amazing. In the sense, we have had the, the slowest, the worst recovery after a uh, recession in the advanced economies, where in contrast, in the emerging market and uh, developing economies, it has been the fastest recovery. In fact, if you look at the red path, zero being uh, 2009, which with annual data is of the year of the recession, you really hardly see a dent in the growth performance. Growth has slowed, but it hasn't shrunk and ever since growth has accelerated. And uh, <clears throat> this is just the mirror image of what we see here in, in the sense that for the past decade or so, this global, this is, this measures the contributions to global growth by our various groupings in the World Economic Outlook. The red bar are the so-called BRICS, and what you can see since the mid-2000s, global growth has, really been carried, has been carried by the major emerging market economies. And even in, in the crisis year 2009, this was the only positive bar uh, that we have seen. Now, what you can also see is relative then to 2010, 2011, over the coming years, we expect the bar to stabilize at a slightly lower level. And in fact, if you look at our uh, projections for the major emerging market economies, what you can see is, say, uh, sorry, if you take 2011, when I think there was still widespread optimism about growth prospects in emerging markets, and where growth in China in particular was expected to remain close to 10%, we then measure the downward revision in our uh, growth, in our output projections for these economies. So here that would be the, the green bar would be for India. That would be the, the difference between output in 2016 in our most recent forecast compared to April 2011. So what you can see for India in terms of levels, that's almost 10%. Uh, if you then go... Uh, to China here, the red bar, it's around 5%. So this is, these are different in levels, so in, they're, all decide, they're also um, in terms of cumulative growth rates, that gives you an indication. So in terms of annual growth rate, the downward revisions will be smaller, because this, uh, this, uh, this bar is distributed over several years, this, uh, the reduction in terms of the reduction in growth. But that's where it goes. And where where is the reduction in, in potential growth? Because if you look at the medium term output projections, that's really uh, what this reflects in our forecast is underlying potential or what our country team expect for medium term growth. So the same sustainable growth with, that's associated to some extent with internal and external balance. And <clears throat> There are a number of uh, factors at play, but I think the, the main reason for the downward uh, revision is that after 10 years of exceptionally rapid growth in emerging markets, some structural to impediments to growth have started to appear. The structural impediments are, are different, but if you look, for example, look at Brazil, the, the blue bar, I think they're very clearly, there are now uh, capacity limits reached in the labor market, where, uh, sort of, if, you want, if you will, failures of past policies to address uh, certain problems in the education sector, for example, uh, now sort of take their revenge in the sense in Brazil, high, uh, educated uh, workers are now uh, scarce 
So in the, and wage pressures have been quite strong in Brazil, uh, reflecting sort of uh, the failure to sort of deepen the education sector and increase the education level of the, of their students and the future labor force. Similarly, there are now severe infrastructure bottlenecks in Brazil. And uh, you know the anecdotes that the farm, that the agriculture sector in Brazil is highly productive, has increased in output, but now output, agriculture output has reached levels that, that the infrastructure is not there, that farmers actually can bring the output to the world markets, to, to shipping to sea and so on and so forth. Uh, there's a story uh, for that similarly in, uh, in, in, China, in India, where red tape go, uh, distortion government and intervention are quite prevalent. And then, the story is slightly different in China, where I think there too, there's some uh, structural impediments, but it's more sort of imbalances in the growth. It was very investment-driven growth. Now we have investment ratios based on the data we have of China, close to 50%, which we think is beyond sort of where investment is still productive, and where over the next few years there should be uh, a return to more balanced growth between consumption and investment. And to the extent that if you have more consumption-driven growth, it will be partly grow, it will be partly demand, it will be partly growth that's more based on services and the service sector tends to be less productive in, in, uh, than the manufacturing sector. And that's one of the reasons why we also think for China growth will eventually uh, come down. Still, I should say though, it's still in our forecast somewhere in the area of uh, 8%. Our, my colleagues uh, working with the malls have now started to reduce uh, the assumption about potential growth closer to the actual growth target of 7.5% of the Chinese government. And this, just as an aside, is interesting that growth target of 7.5% has been around for a while. It shouldn't be a surprise. But for the longest time, it was more thought of uh, being a floor. So that as soon as growth would come close to 7.5%, which it currently, if you look at the first quarter in uh, 2013 in China, it's actually, I think, slightly on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis, even slightly below 7.5%, that was always thought would trigger government intervention, some form of stimulus. And what we have seen over the past year, even when growth comes closer to 7.5%, uh, there is none or very little government intervention to boost uh, aggregate demand. And so I think there is slowly uh, realization in the market, in the markets by investors that the 7.5% is clo probably closer to sort of a midpoint of a target range rather than being a floor. And I think this realization has been uh, reflected in commodity prices and other uh, forward-looking measures uh, that are importantly uh, influenced by developments in China. <clears throat> now the reason reduction of potential growth or medium-term outlook by itself uh, implies some reduction in welfare for the citizens, but in itself wouldn't be a big problem. I think one concern, though, is that uh, what we have seen is that in emerging markets we have had also a lot of capital flows to emerging markets, driven partly by bad conditions in advanced economies, but then also attracted by much better growth prospects in emerging markets. And whenever uh, there is more optimism about the global economy again, capital flows to emerging economies uh, pick up. And if you just look over the, ten year, uh, the past 10 years, typically capital flows to emerging markets again have become stronger than they were even before the crisis. And as a, at the same time, you have rapid financial deepening, partly uh, fed by these capital flows. So the combination of lower than expected sort of medium-term growth prospects and increased uh, financial sector or debt exposure in a larger sense by, by the private sector, that can probably uh, be uh, associated with problems down the road in the sense if the base, the revenue generating base to, uh, to repay debt is lower than expected, that could lead to problems in the debt service, could lead to problems in the banking sector down the road. And 
So, and it's just sort of a small uh, reduction uh, in in the future uh, in future revenue that could lead to then higher non-performing loans and so on and so forth, which could could drag the economy down. Now, reductions or uh, sort of lowering of the growth paths of this kind of one to two three percent in annual growth even does not need to be catastrophic. But the concern is typically when you have phases of very rapid financial deepening that there may be um, at the time of very strong or continued strong growth that there may be some underappreciation of risk, that there may be not enough provisioning, that some of the projects financed with debt might ult may ultimately turn out to be at the margin, not to be sustainable, and this could then lead to dis disappointment and if the problem gets large enough, it could lead to financial sector problems. And then the couples with the concern also that at the period of very rapid financial deepening regulation, the supervisory framework often lacks developments in the financial sector as new instruments, new types of credit, and so on and so forth are being developed. And then the last... Uh, issue at the moment is and is sort of the last sort of reason why there may be some problems down the road in emerging markets and developing economies is that over the past few years is that despite very strong growth or the strong growth was partly uh, supported by relatively easy monetary policy as soon as growth in event, and the events economy started slowing again in 2011 Many economies eased uh, monetary policy, but to some extent also fiscal policy. So we have real policy rates or well below low pre prices averages. That's sort of an indication of the natural rate of interest, the, the interest that sort of should prevail in this uh, steady state. Of course, this is an imperfect measure, and the real rate, may, uh, the natural rate, may have declined a bit, but still policy rate are low, in some cases negative in emerging markets, not uh, uh, a sustainable situation. And at the same time, uh, you also have uh, higher fiscal deficits. And while the fiscal situation is not near as, nearly as problematic, in fact, often the fiscal positions are quite healthy, uh, there is not mu that much room for additional policy stimulus. So you have the combination in the end of lower potential growth some potential financial excesses in the financial market and relatively little uh, policy buffers to sort of counter any uh, weakening of the economy. Okay, let me uh, skip to global imbalances and then here, what to do. Uh, these are some very uh, general uh, policy description in the World Economic Outlook. They also developed for some of the major economies uh, but we focus on, on the big trends. In terms for the euro area, clearly what is needed is, uh, is a combination of policies. I think at the center, what is important to keep support demand to the extent as possible of the euro area as a whole. The key there is monetary policy should remain very accommodating. In fact, uh, the ECB should think about how the transmission of its very low uh, policy rate to the bank can be improved so that you have a better monetary policy transmission that the easy monetary conditions that we have now at the center also pass through to the periphery. Then uh, clearly uh, banking sector reform ultimately for the financial sector to recover and actually be in a, in a position where it can uh, support the private sector there needs to be restructuring, recapitalization of the banking sector. And then uh, banking sector reform also goes along with more banking union. And, uh, there are many, there is the argument that ultimately the, the architecture of the euro area needs to be improved in the sense that the founders or the architects have put the basic architecture in place, that they never thought that the euro area could face a crisis of the kind of the magnitude it's facing now. Now, there are various uh, there are many ideas about also how to strengthen fiscal union. In our view, what's most urgent and realizing 
that there's sort of a limited amount of pol political capital that we have at your disposal, we would say that the political capital should be used to put into place a full banking union that does not only include a single supervisory mechanism, which is already in train, but it would also need the authority of that supervisor to resolve or address or uh, resolve insolvent banks. And second then, as the case of uh, Cyprus have made very clear, in many economies, the banking sector is large relative to the economy. So national deposit insurance are not necessarily sustainable. So you also need a fiscal backstop for to make deposit insurance viable at the euro area level. And then finally, uh, I think in a number of countries you also need uh, structural reforms, there needs to be entitlement reforms and so on and so forth. For the United States and Japan, I think in the short term what is key is A, to keep fiscal adjustment in the US at the, not, uh, at the more, uh, keep it at a more appropriate pace, not sort of trying to put too much of a drag on the recovery, and at the same time, uh, keep monetary policy very accommodative. I think in the United States, low interest rates clearly have helped in bringing the debt burden down. At the same time, we've already talked about that, then we need to uh, have medium-term fiscal plans, for, or medium to fiscal consolidation plans, that are credible and that sort of lay out how to address the sizable uh, fiscal uh, issues that these economies face over the next one to two decades. In terms of the emerging market and developed economies in general, conditions vary uh, depending on the economy, but I think there is a some need to rebuild policy buffers, go back to uh, closer to bring fiscal deficits down or even move to surpluses, normalize the real policy rates, and then also adjust fiscal, uh, not regulatory and supervisory frameworks in the, in the financial sector to address new risks, address, the, uh, address risks that have arisen with a combination of very rapid credit growth and, and large capital inflows. Okay, so much about uh, the World Economic Outlook. Uh, do you have some? Or? Yeah, 10 more Okay. Then let me uh, talk a, a bit about the analytical chapters. And I'm going to just give you, uh, rather than go into any detail, let me try to <coughs> give you some impressions. And the first one is really a chapter about the dog that didn't bark. Is inflation, just mu is inflation muzzled? or is the dog just sleeping? And what you can see here, this is a chart of core inflation among all advanced economies over the past five years. And what's noticeable here, if you look, this is across all 24 advanced economies in our world economic outlook, this is of the band with the 25th, between the 25th and the 75th percentile, is that in the end, core inflation over the past uh, five years have been remarkably stable, around 2%. And the only uh, case where you actually did, in the end, the only country where you did have some deflation in the narrow sense was Japan. Now, in, this, in the previous chart, it may not appear as striking, but here, if you look over time, is, is really is where you can see a straight, striking difference in inflation behavior uh, across recessions. So if you have here, this is the blue line. That is inflation relative to the level of inflation that prevailed at the starting point is what you can see is that inflation really is very close to the starting point, less, uh, less than 1% below. Contrast then this with what you think, what you would expect is more what you expect in a recession when there is a well, big output gap, unemployment is re raising well below uh, the natural rate, uh, is increasing well below the natural rate of uh, employment, you would expect big downward pressure on prices and inflation falling. And indeed, uh, sorry, the, this is the, the, not the great uh, the previous great uh, recession or uh, contraction at the global level was the one in 74, 75, 
And here what you really can see is that inflation, on average, fell by about 4 percentage points. If that were the metric, if that uh, model, if that type of uh, behavior had to have prevailed, if you then start with in, in inflation in early 2008, at roughly 2 to 2.5%, and, and you, you subtract 4%, you would see that you would actually have expected deflation in the advanced economies. And deflation of debt, and the contracting activity, high debt, and deflation is, of course, ever since Irving Fisher introduced the concept of debt, deflation is toxic. And even if you then look go back into 1980s, behavior was very similar. Uh, but then here, the recession around 2000, 2001, when the internet bubble burst was there, but even there it was already quite muted. So what the chapter does, it analyzes what explains the difference in inflation behavior. And in contrast, two big ideas. One is the idea that just the Phillips uh, inflation is less influenced by current output behavior. So that even when activity contracts or activity moderates, is that it has much less of an impact on, on inflation. And they couple this with more credible monetary policy, that is, inflation is driven more by expected future inflation rather than by inflation in the past. That's, so in that sense, you have a flatter, what is called a flatter Phillips curve. So, because again, the Phillips curve sort of describes the behavior of inflation and inflation on employment space is flatter, flatter Phillips curve hypothesis. The other big hypothesis is the, what we call the structural uh, hypotheses. And that is uh, the argument that output caps, that the extent of slack really is not as large as people argue. So that the part of the reason why output is down relative to the crisis is that these reflect on uh, structural problems. Basically that output uh, was ultimately unsustainable before the crisis. Too much housing, investment and so on and so forth. And it's one of the explanations of the great inflation of the 1970s, uh, and I think the most prominent uh, um, economist having put forward this hypothesis is Athanasius Orphanidis, who has said that in the 70s the output gap was overestimated. And that ultimately, uh, when you had the productivity slow down, in sort of around occurring around in the early to mid 70s, that this was not fully appreciated and that macroeconomic policy, in particular monetary policy, was too easy. So, in the chapter, uh, goes into some detail, it looks at these hypotheses, it does an estimation of Phillips curve with uh, techniques that also try to accommodate possible changes in economic behavior over time. But the essence of the analysis is really. Uh, laid out here, and it's the, the it's basically the flattening of the Phillips curve, together with more uh, monetary policy credibility. That is a bigger influence of inflation expectation or stable inflation expectations on current inflation, because here you have the 70s, and that sort of you have a Phillips curve that's falling as it, uh, the short-term Phillips curve. And then you contrast this with the uh, sort of the Phillips curve uh, that prevails since the mid 90s, that is essentially flat. And uh, what also the chapter then does is the metric analyses. It allows for possibility that the natural rate, for example, has changed, that the natural rate has increased because of structural problem, so that the cyclical unemployment or increase in the unemployment rate would be much smaller, and then some of the increase in unemployment is just higher. It allows for all that, but it, the chapter basically concludes uh, that really it's the first big hypothesis, flat the Phillips curve, better anchored inflation expectations that explain recent inflation behavior. Then the question is, what are, are the policy implications? Uh, and there are a number. Uh, so the big, in terms of the, the metaphor, is really the dog has been muzzled, in the sense that 
at the moment, there are concerns that monetary policy is too uh, stimulative or too accommodative, even if there's some mistake in this central bank's assessment of economic conditions, uh, temporary overstimulation, if it's corrected subsequently, is likely to have only a small in fact, uh, effect on inflation. And in fact, uh, there's no reason for inflation fears sort of for central banks to, e uh, to tighten monetary policy too uh, prematurely. Does this mean uh, central banks, monetary policy makers shouldn't worry? Uh, not quite. And so the mirror image that with more stable inflation is actually something maybe almost paradoxical is that inflation becomes less of an indicator for general macroeconomic health. In the sense, in, in the 70s, the idea was, or after the 70s, the idea has been of almost a divine coincidence in the sense if you stabilize inflation that you also stabilize the economy that ultimately that a lot of the macroeconomic instability was coming from the inflation output or inflation unemployment nexus. So when this nexus becomes less important, you can still have macro imbalances, they just don't unnecessarily reflect it in inflation. At the same time, I think it is also key though, what remains true is that uh, anchoring inflation expectations remains important. So central banks still need to be ready. And it's amazing how inflation expectations, despite rising commodity prices over the past, in, early in the mid 2000s and then again in 2009, inflation expect, long term inflation expectations really have remained very stable. And that is, uh, if that were to go, if there were any doubt that the central bank, in the end, on average, would not turn to keep inflation low and stable, that uh, would lead to, uh, again, to fundamental changes in behavior. It also then has uh, implications for how you do monetary policy. Because with a flat to Phillips curve, uh, cyclical fluctuations have only a limited impact on inflation. Uh, but then what this means is that if you stabilize inflation, it's not necessarily true that you also sort of stabilize output. And then the question is, what are your options? And uh, this is currently discussed. The Bank of England, for example, has, recent ha has recently had a review of its monetary policy framework. But clearly, what one implication, I think, is evident that in such a situation, you can actually have prolonged deviations of inflation from target. And if in the end, if inflation is expected to go back, that is not necessarily uh, an indication of destabilization. It also has raised the question, for example, whether central banks should have explicitly a dual mandate that they not only care about inflation, but only about output. And the Fed, for example, has recently sort of still, uh, moved away from giving forward guidance on interest rates based on dates, so you can expect monetary policies to stay easy until 2015. It has changed to give threshold, as said, uh, as long as, I believe, uh, unemployment is above 6.5%, assuming that the natural rate of uh, unemployment is actually below 6.5%, and provided inflation expectations don't, indicate, don't go above 2.5%, uh, and in that case, they will keep monetary policy easy. But this, uh, we had recently a conference at the IMF on rethinking macro, where the sort of implications of flat the Phillips curve for monetary policy making were uh, discussed, and the debate is ongoing. I think there's no sort of mainstream consensus yet of, on where this will end. Then let me uh, just show you two pictures of uh, growth takeoffs in low in, in economies. And what is quite striking is that over the past 15 years or so, we have had a second uh, wave of growth takeoffs emerging in developing economies. And if you believe, it always depends a bit on the metric for the growth takeoff, but still, if you believe our metric is good, then clearly that we have had the biggest waves sort of takeoffs in the post-World War II period. It's a bigger wave than, say, in the 
1950s and 1960s, where there was the big sort of first growth uh, takeoff in uh, wave and low income economies. So, good uh, macroeconomic policy in low income countries have, have become better. They have reduced that. There's much. Uh, they have done much structural reforms. So in many ways, what's the worry? I think one of the of the worries is is that the experience then of the 1980s, where actually uh, the situation was reversed, where many countries went through a prolonged period of stagnation or actually outward declining, and uh, reversing some of the earlier gains in, in development. And the reasons are widely thought, for example, to be twofold, that these economies were too dependent on external financing, on easy external financing, when that stopped, with the focus shock in the early 80s, when commodity prices started declining, that just all the gains in development were unraveled. And one thing was striking, and uh, this is a chart that shows you the path of output after a country embarks on a, uh, on a growth takeoff. And the growth takeoff here is defined as sustained average growth of three and a, per capita income growth of five and a half percent over five years. You may think this is not much, but still, it's a relatively demanding threshold. You still have, in, at any point in time, you have many economies that are not in a takeoff phase. But what's interesting is that once a, car a country is on a takeoff, <coughs> it sort of stays on a path of rapid growth for much longer than the, sort of the, the metric itself to identify the takeoffs. And so here, for example, after 10 years, after takeoff, uh, income has increased by 50%. Here is in the earlier wave there too, you sort of see income doubles. So growth takeoffs are, uh, are a big thing. They're very important and they have often laid the foundation then for lasting growth. The growth takeoff of Korea, for example, uh, is, is widely known. So what the chapter then does, it analyzes uh, growth takeoffs over the past 15 years and compares them to, uh, to takeoffs in previous years and asks the question, are these recent takeoffs more sustainable? Or will, if external financing conditions will sort of tighten a bit, if, there are less, if less capital is flowing once uh, conditions in advanced economies normalize, once commodity prices maybe become a bit weaker, will it all um, unravel? And what it finds, it highlights uh, two, uh, one very uh, evident, uh, or self-evident, that countries that, em uh, sorry, that embark on a growth takeoff, that one thing that sets them apart is really those on a takeoff are countries that are investing. These are, these are the blue bars. And this is the new generation of takeoffs since 1990s. These were the previous ones, mostly in the 1950s and 60s. And then if you compare this to other economies, is you see a striking difference in investment behavior. But then if you look uh, across um, economies and uh, across previous generation of takeoffs, is that then what you see is that interestingly is that you have in this way of growth takeoffs a lot more uh, external financing in the, for, in the form of uh, net, uh, foreign direct investment, which is typically thought to be more stable, a more sustainable uh, source of uh, external financing. And then at the same time, what, you, what also what has happened is that actually external debt, and here you see uh, external debt just before the takeoff, in the beginning of the takeoff, and in the end, 10 years after the takeoff, is if you contrast that, Earlier growth takeoffs uh, coincided with a buildup of external debt. So when global financial conditions turned around, countries were exposed. Interestingly here, external debt is, is down. And similarly, if you then look at inflation, and inflation here is basically a um, very summary indicator of macroeconomic policies, is macroeconomic policies have been much more oriented towards stability keeping macroeconomic and financial stability. Inflation typically was higher in the 50s and 60s as uh, countries partly supported uh, the growth process 
through easy macro policies, whereas since 1990s, uh, inflation has come down, there has been disinflation, and much of the impetus from, for, for growth has come from trade integration and structural reforms. So the chapter on a sort of cautiously optimistic note concludes that maybe this time it will be better and there will be less likelihood of, uh, sort of the growth takeoffs ending in tears. So let me conclude here and uh, have questions, any other comments, new views on the world economy? Any, any, question? question? uh, any questions? I have some. Uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, tight credit is uh, one important drug uh, for uh, growth and recovery in Europe. And uh, sometimes people, or in the past, uh, people mentioned that uh, uncertainty uh, was another one. Uh, and uncertainty both uh, driving investment and uh, consumption, and uh, in particular uncertainty with regard to how exactly, uh, how exactly uh, fiscal adjustment uh, will be done, whether the Eurozone is going to survive or not. And uh, in your opinion, or uh, maybe there are some estimates, uh, what is the contribution of those uh, two factors? Uh, one uh, is uh, unavailable or hardly uh, uh, available uh, by credit, and the other one uh, uncertainty. Uh, these days, uh, compared with uh, what was uh, a year, uh, one year ago. In fact, we have uh, in, in chapter two there is uh, an appendix, so to uh, speak, uh, called uh, spillover feature, where uh, a colleague in my in my division analyzes the impact of policy and sort of in particular on investment. Um, I think when it comes sort of to quantifying the contribution of the various factors, we have to be aware of limitations. It's so to be precise is, is very difficult. Uh, and, and the issue is that it's very difficult to measure the extent of or what, what is an uncertainty. So my, my colleague uh, uses an indicator of policy uncertainty that was developed by an econ Stanford economist, Nick Bloom, and a number of co-authors. And they use a number of measures, but partly it's based on internet searches. So it's as soon as it's, it's sort of you have a combination of search terms, macroeconomic or economic policies, recessions, and certainly when these searches increase, that's an indication that there is more policy uncertainty. In the United States, there are also there are some measures of tax uncertainty at any point in time. How many as in the United States, many of the tax provisions are temporary, require renewal, and so on and so forth. They look at the amount of, uh, of tax provisions that are due for renewal by the end of the year. And so when the amount of these renewals is higher, they also say that policy uncertainty is higher. Now, the problem in terms of quantifying uh, the uncertainty, though, is uncertainty is also depends on prospects. Right? Uncertainty more general, but also policy uncertainty as part of when there's more uncertainty what central banks or fiscal policy makers will do, that will also depend on their what they think about the future economic conditions. So controlling for expectations of, or changes in expectations uh, for future economic conditions is, is tricky. But so applying one possible approach where, for example, uh, in the regression, measures of current activity are included and future active or expectations of future activity are approximated with stock prices, which are, among other things, a forward-looking uh, measure of economic conditions. Based on that uh, analysis, uh, my colleagues come to the conclusion that can be sizable contributions of uncertainty and activity. Now, specifically, when you look at the euro area, I think not all the uncertainty has been resolved, and that's uh, one of the, the issues of the risks that are still prevalent. I think the most significant development of the, over the past nine months or so is that I think risks 
or concerns or doubts about the euro area having a framework to solve acute crisis risks, that these risks, I think, have come down with the OMT, with the ESM, and other measures, and the ability, actually, for the euro area policymakers to agree, and the Greek uh, population, too, and after the election, Greek politicians agreeing on a new program so it has uh, relieved much of the short-term uncertainty. On the other hand, as you say, um, um, not all of that uncertainty has disappeared. I think I mean, the path out of the crisis, in particular, for example, about financial sector reform, is, is not quite clear. I mean, if you look at the ESM, initially in the summer, it was seemed understood that the ESM could, if necessary, directly recapitalize banks. Right, in the periphery. Uh, now, more recently, there have been uh, some doubts voiced in Northern Europe, uh, Germany, Finland. So, again, there are doubts. So, I think policy certainly plays, plays a big role. How much uh, is a bit uh, difficult to say. Dynamics of indebtedness of the households in the United States and Europe. And uh, ca can you explain uh, what are the reasons for such differences that in the United States it has been declining and in, in the Eurozone it still levels? Um, I think there are a number of reasons. Um, in the United States, um, and this is not necessarily a normative statement, but I think with hindsight, uh, the United States had, and maybe that was never planned for, had a very efficient debt, household debt resolution mechanism in the sense in most states, households can just walk away. They take the key of the house and tell the bank, here is the house, now it's your problem. And there's no, it doesn't imply personal bankruptcy in the sense if you default on a mortgage in many states, it doesn't imply uh, bankruptcy procedures. Credit ratings of these households, of course, uh, go down the tube. They may find it very difficult to get new credit, but uh, they can continue. And in fact, it has been uh, sort of walking away from mortgages. Uh, has been done on a larger scale in the subprime uh, segment. The, the other reason is that they also, I think, even though we have argued that there could be more efforts, there have been some efforts in the United States at loan modification, in the sense that banks, partly uh, with some support for the government, but partly have just embarked on programs of loan modifications where loans were reduced to levels uh, where banks, uh, where banks think it's ultimately is going to be sustainable, and to some extent, uh, banks have in, have incentives for loan modification or contract uh, modification. In a sense, ex ante, right? They don't want to signal readiness to engage in loan modification because it. Uh, it's sort of uh, it, it, uh, it's bad for the payers' morale if you already sort of anticipate that I just get into problems. The bank may have to accommodate me, but exposed after the crisis, uh, if there are risks to a large, significant part of your loan book or your assets, there may be actually incentives to reduce the loan burden to sustainable levels, and thereby prevent future default and partly absorb. Uh, the losses on, on banks' income and, uh, and try to uh, recover that uh, through future profitability. So in the sense you take a short-term hit because you write down part of your outstanding assets, but ultimately if your future payments stream is more certain, you have better profitability in, in the future. And I think, and then the the third part is the housing market in, in the United States has uh, started to recover. I think in Europe there have been uh, efforts at 
bringing that down have been much smaller. But ultimately, these efforts are all based on more saving uh, to repay loan or reduce, uh, reduce loans and really reduce uh, the debt burden. Which, in a contracting economy, I mean, the rising unemployment is very difficult to do. And so I think this is one of the reasons why uh, there are questions. How is the debt over the private debt overhang? Does it need uh, public intervention in the euro area in some of the countries where debt burdens are higher? Any other questions? Uh, I have a great question. Um, uh, on your list of policy implications, uh, uh, you mentioned that uh, one was uh, over uh, stimulation uh, should not harm uh, much uh, because, uh, uh, well, in, in a situation when, uh, where uh, inflation expectations are uh, very well uh, anchored. But uh, does this statement uh, depend on uh, which of the two hypotheses uh, that you mentioned, and that uh, each of them explaining why uh, the Phillips curve uh, appears more uh, flat than uh, it used to be uh, holds. Uh, for example, if, uh, what if, uh, will the uh, same uh, policy implication uh, apply uh, if uh, the potential is lower or the slack in the economy is lower than uh, we think? Well, I think the, the, the key is um, to preserve credibility. And so it's possible, right, that the potential may turn out to be lower than expected. We, there are you know, people who have voiced, for example, the view that in the United States, potential now is closer to 2% rather than 2.5%. While this is not that big of a difference over the a few years, it can make a difference. But I think the key, key there is, is how to preserve the credibility and what's implicitly uh, built in or the, the sort of the framework of the neo Keynesian sort of macro model assumes that if there is really a shock to potential output, if something unexpected happened to, to unexpected output, that once this is realized that policies are adjusted. So even if, say, at the moment, central banks keep monetary policy easing, assuming that the output gap is just very large. If it turns out, based on when new information comes in, that maybe it's smaller, then the expectation is that policies will adjust and take that into account. And they will start correcting based on that new information. And the chapter goes at some length and discusses how this was different in, in the 1970s. When I think at the onset of the great inflation around 74, 75, where people realized that inflation had been creeping up. And in the 60s, in, in, in particular in the United States, the Fed people thought price stability was more or less consistent with inflation at 2%. By the early 70s, inflation had kept up, uh, crept up to 3%. And then the policymakers in the United States were very explicit in the sense that what they said is, well, we don't like 3%, but we're not really going to do anything about it. Because reduce, bring inflation back to 2% will just be too costly in terms of the short-term implications for output. And so, in terms of sort of uh, you know, modern macro speak, uh, the ratcheting up of inflation expectations was, uh, was validated. So that in a sense, as soon as was there a conflict, as soon as there was any indication of an inflation unemployment trade-off, that then uh, monetary policy makers just had cold feet and did uh, and the chapter then contrasts uh, the situation in the United States with the situation in, in, in Germany. And in Germany, the Phillips curve at the time also was steeper. 
And so you have still quite a bit of cyclical fluctuations in inflation in the 70s and early 80s. But unlike in the US, these inflation fluctuations were sort of around a stable mean. Whereas in the United States, average inflation was creeping up. And so in terms of even if it turns out that in the end, the hindsight hypothesis one was relevant, not necessarily to explain past inflation behavior, but that just there's more, there's more, there are more structural problems than expected. It would be the central banks would have to uh, take into account the lower potential and reduce uh, the output gap, which ultimately then also would, at the current situation, probably uh, imply that if, if the economy excuse me, if the economy recovery continues, that it will start tightening early. And if that sort of response were lacking, then uh, based on sort of standard macro theory, we would expect that then the whole uh, unraveling of sort of stable inflation expectations would begin. I think the issue is uh, that we have very few, we have very few cases where this has happened. It happened in the 70s, it happened on a uh, widespread basis, but in the cross section, it's sort of really one episode where that happened at the same time. We don't have uh, many episodes in economic history where we have sort of unraveling of inflation expectations. So what exactly could trigger uh, changes in expectations? Uh, I think is much harder to pin down. A few years, people were arguing that if prices of the most important goods and, cons and household and consumer baskets would increase sharply, so in, in the United States, if the price of gasoline would just go up, that this would lead uh, lead to uh, this anchoring of inflation expectations. But uh, interestingly, that hasn't really happened. And, uh, so. I think the, the theory of expectation formations, we have tried to look at and sort of find uh, a good theory, a good way of sort of modeling how people form inflation expectations beyond sort of the standard model where we ultimately assume that people have rational expectations, they know everything is going on. It's uh, very tricky. Probably the last uh, question. What are your projections for the commodity prices, especially oil, for the next several years? So, uh, our projections at the moment are that commodity prices sort of stabilize at current high levels in real terms. If you look at the oil price, uh, the projection, uh, if I'm not mistaken, is for, and we have our indicator, our average petroleum spot price is, in, is an average of three uh, major price benchmarks is that it would stay around $100, $100 a barrel in normal terms this year and next year, and then it would slightly decline to around $93 by 2018. And the projections are similar uh, for other commodity, non-renewable prices of non-renewable uh, natural resources. Where we see a bit bigger price declines is in the is in the agricultural sector where um, high prices have lead, led to more farm activity and uh, more investment in agriculture and so that some of the price increases were more clearly driven by supply, temporary supply, weather related supply issues and so that we see a correction back to more normal price levels. Right. Let us uh, thank our guests. Thank you very much. Is that inside the speech? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much for coming on uh, evening, five o'clock at the IMF on the seminars at five o'clock. The... <laughs> it's very tricky to keep up with the internet. Thank you.